Welcome back to the Diana Initiative. And we've been thanking our sponsors all day today, but you know, I want to take a moment just to thank the staff of TDI and also all the volunteers and speakers. We couldn't have an event without them. They're doing an amazing job. So please take a moment to, to thank the staff. Um, you can do that in Discord. Thank the volunteers um, if you see them in Discord. Um, and yeah, <laughs> oh, there we go. Now I'm live. Um, I don't know. <laughs> okay, I'll, re I'll repeat myself. Um, I, I think everybody got it, but yes, thank you all for being here at the Diana Initiative. And sometimes we have, even we have technical issues. It's not perfect, but yes, thank, thank the speakers, thank the volunteers and thank the staff. They've been doing an amazing job here today. Um, without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Siva Ranjani. She is going to talk about how she hacked into the OF Oh, Ofo bikes in Singapore. This sounds like quite the interesting talk. Um, so please take it away. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm excited to be here. I'm going to give a very quick, and very short talk. Hope it's very engaging for all of you. Um, I just want to share my experience on how I. Um, hacked into one of these yellow bikes, which were popular throughout the island in um, 2018. So around four years ago, to be exact. Uh, so um, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, so OFO was a, is a um, bike sharing company that was founded in 2014 in Beijing, China. And I... Uh, did this research in 2018 as a part of a startup that was attached to National University of Singapore, where I was working back then. So uh, the current status of the company is it's been defunct um, since as of 2000, 2020. So um, as a part of the responsible disclosure policy, I've just attached some uh, confirmation from o OFO acknowledging my contribution to um, their product development and uh, it's uh, also you can see another snippet where it says that it's no longer allowed to legally operate in Singapore anymore. So I also want to state a disclaimer that I am here on my personal um, opinion. I'm not re representing my current company or my former employer. It's just myself at this point. So, um, yes. Uh, so, can we go to the next slide, please? So, basically, OFO is a bike sharing app. It was, I think, the first of its kind in Singapore, and people were using it all over. It's uh, Bluetooth based. And all you have to do is like you have your mobile app in the bike itself. You just like mm, go to the uh, app, you just pay a bit of your uh, amount of money and then it just like uh, unlocks the bike for you. When you end the ride, you pay, place it in another, uh, anywhere else where there's a, um, actually anywhere else in Singapore where there's a bike rack and you just like, stop the ride in the ride lock it again and then the uh, money would be calculated for that um, amount uh, the amount of distance that you've covered so far so it was like the popular choice of bike sharing back in 2018 when i was working on it uh, can we do the next slide please so uh, the protocol specifically used here is bluetooth low energy uh, not the bluetooth classic primarily because the low energy is, you know, to conserve the power consumption of the devices itself. So it basically only uses one third the speed of Bluetooth Classic and the power does not exceed half of that. So which makes it a very ideal candidate for um, IoT devices. So um, the main characteristic in a Bluetooth low energy protocol is something called as GATT which is a generic attribute profile. 
So in simple terms, what it means is like, it's just a definition of two devices which are interacting with each other. They kind of share information back and forth uh, through some things called the services and characteristics where they agree on what sort of uh, 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 information that they wanna share between them. It's also to be um, noted the connections are exclusive. So only one connection is valid at a time. So you can be only with one peripheral, BLE peripheral and BLE essentials. So it's just one connection, one valid connection at a time. So um, can we go to the next slide, please? So uh, this is how the pairing process works in a Bluetooth low energy device. So we have the pairing request from the initiating device, which would be the BLE peripheral in this case. So they just um, exchange information on what sort of bonding requirements they have, what sort of authentication requirements they have, the maximum link size and, uh, and all the associated information. Then the devices decide among themselves how they want to set up a secure connection. And then this to be this particular communication itself is unencrypted. So um, then the next stage is they will generate a temporary key or TK. More on this on the next slide. And after this is uh, I'm not uh, can you just go back a little bit again? Yeah. So and then the final step is we would it would generate a short-term key, which is a combination of the temporary temporary key with some random values um, used with them. So the definition of random values could be, again, depending on the devices itself. So um, the next one. Uh, so for the pairing methods, there are very three very common ones that are found in Bluetooth low energy devices. The first one is just works, where the TK itself is zero, which means TK and STK, everything is unencrypted. It's possibly the lowest level of security that you would find. Um, the passkey display is basically you have a six digit number passed between devices. And the most secure of them all is out of band OOB. Um, it uses a large temporal key up to 20, 128 bits, which making it much, much more secure. And most of them use near field communications. And for NFCs, you have to be really, really close. The monster in the middle have to be super close to the device in question. So which means you would technically know that, you know, uh, someone is right there in front of you. So this for this reason, NFC is considered secure. Um, can you go to the next uh, slide, please? So there are also different security modes and different security levels associated with each of them. So if you choose mode one, there are different levels, one being the least secure and four being uh, the most secure. So one is basically no authentication, no encryption. Two is unauthenticated pairing, but there's encryption. And then the third one is authenticated pairing with encryption. And the fourth one is authenticated LE secure connections with encryptions as well. Um, can we go to the next one? So in security mode two, there's like unauthenticated pairing with data signing and authenticated pairing with data signing. So um, these are the different modes and these are different levels. So the higher the level, the more secure it is, depending upon how, which mode the two devices were uh, deciding on during the uh, GATT uh, process. And also um, two things to keep in mind is, apart from the communication itself, it's also uh, more secure if the channel, BLE channel itself is, um, encrypted or is secure by uh, any other means. So the previous one security mode one, level four also addresses this, this uh, securing the channel along with the communications. Um, can you go to the next slide please? Okay, so these are the simple devices that I have used for um, doing, performing the monster in the middle attacks. So it's, I used a sniffer, which basically sniffs all the um, Bluetooth low energy communications. 
and then I used a um, blue fruit friend, which is used to send messages to the BLE channel that you want. So um, I used a already available app called Nord Nordic Semiconductor Connect, Conductor Connect, which basically can just like send out GAT messages to um, devices nearby. So you can either use that or you can just write your own app. So whatever uh, you feel like. So can we go to the next slide? So it's the process is um, pretty, pretty straightforward because the um, level of encryption is pretty low in O4. So I do remember having a um, pin uh, entering, have to enter a passcode on both the sides. So um, it would probably be not the just key, but the um, uh, pass key, which is the second uh, layer of uh, padding method. And uh, here, um, it's, it goes like this. So first I start the low energy sniffer and then I just select OFO bike and then I start like a wire shock capture so I can monitor all the communications going to and from that. So, and then it now it's just communications from the application, the OFO application to the OFO bike. And then you have the monster in the middle, which is you, you have, the bike which you want to manipulate the uh, GATT communication between them. So uh, the first one is the right message and it just like if you were able to see the screen it's just a very simple right request and once you send that uh, the bike sends an acknowledgement saying okay so that's the first right message that happens after all the communications have taken place already and now the the goal is to unlock the bike so at this point you want to um, either lock or unlock the bike depending upon what you want to do so this is the first message that is sent it's sent from the app to the bike, bike acknowledges it so it's great um, can you go to the next um, message so in the message one we're not doing anything as a monster we're just observing that the app and the bike exchange this message we just stay silent now in the command two that uh, the bike sends back uh, the uh, app sends to the bike so here it's a a very constant unique value that is same that stays the same for each bike so if you have it either has two starting values it always started with either 2 to 23 or it started with a uh, hash so it always started like that and it always remained the same for each bike which is a bit of a problem because once you know that that is unique for each bike and once you're able to figure that out that itself is like uh, passes a lot of the uh, security mechanisms they have so once you, once you send that, the bottom picture there is the acknowledgement from the bike. The bike says, okay. So th again, at this point as a monster, you're just sitting and you're observing. So for a replay attack, what you would need to do is just know what are the values that are being there and then just send it at the time that is uh, going to cause the uh, maximum security damage. So the next one, next slide, please. Okay, so the final command is from us to the bike. So we are pretending to be coming from the app, but it's actually coming from us. So again, another observation is that the last, um, the last command, at least for the bikes that have tested, always remain the same. So once I send the values back to the um, bike itself pretending to be from the app uh, it was unlocked so when i tried the same procedure on an unlocked bike it locked which could be pretty dangerous if you're riding the bike and then you suddenly lock it you can't move the wheels so the person falls down so it's also pretty dangerous and that's it so in the next slide i'll be showing a 30 second video demo where you can actually see all of this happening so maybe, uh, yes, uh, if you're able to click on that and just play that. So I'm using this app 
and I just like send all the GADT messages, um, the three write commands. So I just modify the different values according to, you know, what we have just discussed in the previous slides. So once I send all the three commands, So again, I think one thing I forgot to mention is the command one and the command two where we're just silent observers. We observe it and now we just repeat the same commands and it still works. Just using the same commands from before, just do it, just send it back again. And the third one, you just also send it um, as I mentioned. So it just, you're able to see the, um, the bike just locked. So uh, the next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so that's it. So now we're just going to just give you some recommendations on how to keep BLE devices secure. So a research from Ohio University has said that about 7.4% of the BLE devices are vulnerable to eavesdropping attacks, which is exactly what I've demonstrated here. So uh, the recommendations, which you might all have already guessed, is the pairing mode should be of the highest level, uh, highest uh, security level as possible. So instead of using the pass key mode that is currently there, uh, probably use um, out of band. So you can use a longer uh, TK value, uh, temporary key value, and then the um, channel is also protected if you use a level four so then it's extremely hard to break into this um the next one so yes yeah, security level as i just mentioned just choose a higher security level as possible it may always not be possible to choose the highest highest security level at any chance but we have to try to do as may, as high as we can so another thing that you have you may have noticed is the constant appearance of uh, static keys or just unique keys so that's a bit problematic so if they're able to do dynamic keys or values instead of static variables that also would make it very harder because you don't know what's the current uh, value that you're working with and another thing is um obfuscate the app code so you're trying to actually get the android app code and everything to see if there is any um values that are being shown as it was shown like when i open the app i was able to see the uh, long digits of 23 or ash starting with which the unique value to the bike so if you're able to obfuscate the app code then you will make it much much harder to reverse engineer or the monsters to reverse engineer your um, code or product and this one is specifically for ofo but i think it may also hold true for certain other devices which have a lot of uh, data profile available so if there is a data profile for each user then you can just see if there is an detect any abnormal usage so if somebody is just locking and unlocking multiple times and it's not you know useful for it's not their usual behavior then again that's something that you know the company can enforce from their end so uh can you go to the next slide, please? So, and the last one is um, identify some key attack surfaces. So if you are getting user inputs in like an app or something, just try to sanitize the inputs and monitor all the communi inter-process communication, either with the company server or um, inter-process communications with the apps on device itself, like the device level. So these are the things that can make uh, replay attacks or monster in the mid middle attacks much harder. Um, actually, so I think that's the end of my talk. Um, yeah, I really hope all of you enjoyed it. Oh, I want to thank you for that talk. That was great. Um, 
I, it makes me want to go do a little more um, BLE hacking myself. But what I want to know is why has no one started a unicycle sharing company? Um, I really want to see that, but oh well. Um, anyway, thank you all. And um, thank you, Ranjani. Um, great talk and enjoy the rest of the Diana Initiative.